Well, hey guys, and welcome back to Maine Fish and Wildlife for a little more remote learning here. We're going to continue our look at some of that, that history of North American wildlife management today. Last time around, we got a glimpse at some of these historical uh, ebb and flow of our philosophy towards wildlife. Today, we'll focus on that history, where we've come from, and where are we today. So we're going to break this down into five different eras. And I'm not going to require you guys to remember the dates of these eras, but I think it's important to realize kind of the progression that we've had uh, right, right in line with that philosophy towards wildlife, the progression we've had in our systems of management of wildlife uh, here in North America. And it's one of the reasons that we've done that assignment last time or two classes ago on the success story of North American wildlife management because we had some pretty dark times that we're going to look at today. Sometimes that uh, we, we almost kind of lost it all. Luckily, we've switched it around now and have created some systems that have allowed for a little more sustainability. So let's jump right in here. Hopefully you've got your notes uh, in Notability open, those Unit 1 notes that we've been tinkering away on. And again, today's basic assignment will be to screenshot your notes when you're all done and submit to the assignment folder in Google Classroom. So have those notes open. I have mine open over here in uh, Notability, and I'm using that classic four-finger swipe to go back and forth between apps like a legendary iPad user that I am. So just follow along with me and uh, we, we'll, we'll, we'll get these notes done here today. So let's think about the history of wildlife management. So if we go along here, we're gonna begin our look at wildlife management here in North America during this era of abundance. And this is kind of around the time that Europeans are first showing up to our continent. They're, they're encountering a continent that is absolutely uh, rich with wildlife. Everywhere you look, there's wildlife. And it created this sense that uh, we have a resource that could never, ever be depleted. And you've got to keep in mind, these European settlers that are arriving are coming from uh, uh, European countries in which wildlife is managed much differently. It belongs to the to the, the king and queen in many cases, um, and or the deeded gentry, the landowners themselves own the wildlife, which is a much different system than we have here in North America and it led to a lot of uh, over harvest that we'll see in a few minutes but you gotta you gotta think about these people thinking man there's no way these things could ever be over harvested and holy cow all of a sudden we're allowed to live off the land and you can imagine uh, the recipe for disaster that took place but for uh, uh, you know a, a while there we had this era of abundance from about 1600 to 1849 we have uh, Native American management essentially in place um, and European settlements are beginning to cause these localized extirpations. And by extirpate, we mean uh, when, we, when creatures are removed from an area but not extinct from the earth. Some examples we've talked about in class would be wolves and mountain lions and woodland caribou in Maine are all considered extirpated. They once lived here but no longer live here. Uh, and this is, we start to see the persecution of certain species like wolves in Massachusetts. They begin to put this bounty on wolves. If you kill a wolf and bring evidence, you get a penny, so a penny bounty on wolves. So if we go to our, uh, our note sheet here, the era of abundance, we can, we'll list a few things. We'll call it Native American management. A little bit more of a sustainable lifestyle uh, in terms of um, wildlife management and use. There weren't as many people around. They were able to harvest in a way that, that uh, created a sustainable uh, use, but uh, there is debate on, on that as well uh, in terms of the way Native Americans managed wildlife in certain certain regions and during certain time periods. There's even uh, a, a theory now that we know early, early Spanish uh, settlers may have arrived in North America and brought smallpox with them and essentially wiped out, um, you know, unfortunately thousands and thousands of Native Americans across the continent leaving uh, a long time with a void of humanity on the landscape. So when Europeans did show up, we have massive amounts of wildlife because um, the Native Americans in many cases had been extirpated themselves. And those early Spanish accounts, in fact, reported very, very little wildlife. I believe there was one uh, Spanish expedition um, that, well, I, I believe they were on foot from like Florida to Georgia or something like that. And I don't know if they, I think they reported, they don't think they saw a deer or a wild turkey the entire walk. And it would be impossible today to walk from Florida to Georgia and not witness a wild turkey or a deer. So the following expeditions of the Spanish, they brought pigs, uh, you know, and all kinds of creatures to feed themselves because the, the early reports were that there's nothing to eat. There's no wildlife. So, you know, 100 years or so later, we've got a continent booming with wildlife and people think maybe that was because of 
um, you know, a decrease in Native American densities on the landscape. So kind of a sad tale, but really interesting that maybe Native Americans had more of an effect on wildlife populations than uh, people initially suspected. So the gist of this era, though, 1600 to 1849, is that wildlife uh, is super abundant, as the name uh, suggests. Wildlife is super abundant on the landscape. It's all over the place. It is the era of abundance, and it's kind of uh, what we all imagine when we think about this early continent. Lewis and Clark, you know, heading west, um, uh, searching for the Pacific, and just the numbers of wildlife that they report and the scenes that they see uh, are just mind-boggling to us today. So right around the middle of the 1800s, 1850 to 1872 or so, we run into this era of over-exploitation. And the era of over-exploitation is exactly what it sounds like we begin to really, really over-harvest wildlife and basically all wildlife. What happens here is our technology is improving. Um, you know, the weaponry we're using to harvest these wildlife is becoming more efficient. And people are moving west with the railroads. Our numbers are expanding. It's the Industrial Revolution. We're uh, taking away their habitat, but really, really over-harvesting them. The bison, which we talked about during our success story lesson there, uh, is kind of the poster child of this. As those railroads moved west and uh, bison uh, hides became valuable when we, when we learned how to tan them well, um, we nearly pushed bison to extinction. That there is a photo of some guys, I believe outside of Miles City in Montana uh, or somewhere out west, and that is a pile of bison skulls, like a legit mountain of bison skulls. And those would have been picked up off the prairie uh, years after they were harvested. They would have gone around picking up the bones to help in refining sugar and making fertilizer. Uh, but really, when we were harvesting those bison, it was just for their hides. They had no refrigeration and no way of preserving that meat long-term. They were hunting them for their skins. So that brief time, we really, really did a number on wildlife. So that era of over-exploitation, we're gonna say, um, we'll say technology is improving. Think about just the firearms they were using. We were all of a sudden introducing repeating arms and. Um, you know, smokeless powder and it allowed them to harvest more than one creature at once rather than utilizing um, muskets and things like that. So technology is improving and uh, wildlife populations are being decimated, we'll say, right? Because we are hunting them for food and for um, their skin and feathers and everything and uh, you know the supplies we needed for survival and to build the country and it was um, a time much more utilitarian outlook towards wildlife all those bison out there in the prairie they're there for people we might as well go get them and that was kind of the way people uh, viewed wildlife back then now right around 1872 um, that we have this milestone. In 1872, we put uh, Yellowstone National Park in place here in the United States. It's actually the first ever national park anywhere in the world. Yellowstone National Park, the first country ever uh, to, to utilize this, to create this national park and protect this landscape and the wildlife on it. And it was kind of our first hint that Americans were gonna begin to make choices to preserve and ensure the future of wildlife on our continent. We valued it enough that we wanted to be here forever and we realized that it was disappearing very quickly. So there's all kinds of things that went into effect here during this era, but the era of protection, again, is exactly what it sounds like. It's this era where we started to put in protections and bag limits and uh, pass laws to protect these wildlife and ensure that they'd be here forever. So we could say, I think it's important, 1872, Yellowstone. National Park, um, and we're passing laws to protect wildlife. I mentioned on that last slide the Lacey Act that prevented uh, the transport of game across state lines, and it essentially ended the market hunting of ducks and all kinds of other creatures. And uh, super important that wood duck that we've been talking about a lot in class was, you know, essentially saved by the Lacey Act along with a lot of other birds that were being commercially harvested for their feathers and meat. So um, we passed laws to protect wildlife. And this is kind of where our, our boy Teddy Roosevelt, who we're going to talk about a lot, um, comes onto the scene. So uh, Teddy Roosevelt is there. He's kind of a player during this era of protection. He was the president of the United States 
um, during the turn of the century there, right around 1900. So um, right there smack dab in the middle of the air protection. We've got Teddy Roosevelt creating uh, the National Wildlife Refuge System, the U.S. Forest, uh, or, uh, US Forest Service and creating national forests all over the country and really, really working to protect um, wildlife habitat as well as create public lands where uh, Americans will be able to recreate and utilize natural resources uh, in perpetuity. So pretty cool stuff. Um, and that's the era of protection. Now, we can fast forward a little bit here to the era of game management. And in the era of game management, uh, we, we're talking about the 1930s through the mid-1960s. Um, we begin to utilize science as a way to manage wildlife. We realize that Americans uh, are enjoying the, the sustainable use of wildlife, but it's gonna require science and research to do it in a sustainable way, and it's gonna require money. So a couple of big things happen here. Um, we begin to uh, create state game agencies like the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and we start to employ scientists to study wildlife and find sustainable ways of allowing harvest, but doing it in a way that uh, ensures future generations. We call that conservationism, right? And uh, right in the middle there, 1937, we've got the Pittman-Robertson Act, which is really, really important. That was passed uh, uh, by the U.S. Um, uh, legislature there, and they and they essentially put in a 10% tax on all uh, guns and ammunition and certain hunting equipment, and all of that money goes to wildlife management. There's a similar act called the Dingle Johnson Act that taxes fishing equipment, and all of that money goes to management of our, our fisheries. So really important. Uh, those hunters and fishermen out there have a lot of money that they're putting into the management of these wildlife um, in a lot of different ways. When we buy hunting and fishing licenses and when we buy all this equipment, there, there are hidden taxes on that equipment that go directly to the management of wildlife. And in many ways, these outdoorsmen fund the management and conservation of wildlife. So the era of game management uh, is super important. It's all about managing game species though. We don't, back then we weren't doing a lot for non-game. Remember, we're only, we're only managing now uh, these creatures that we hunt or fish for and there's a biologist there with a white-tailed deer over his shoulder. Um, but that's really, really important. It would have been unheard of to spend money and time researching monarch butterflies during this time, right? They, nobody cared about butterflies. They wanted more deer and more uh, moose and more bears and things like that, rabbits and pheasants and partridge. Um, that was what the era of game management is all about, and that's a really important aspect that we want to get into our notes. So the era of game management, um, we're just going to say uh, use science. to manage wildlife. We'll say conservationism is born. Um, laws passed to fund wildlife management. Um, I'm gonna put in parentheses here. Really all we cared about though is game. The name of that, that uh, era is really important. And in fact, um, yeah, it, it was really just heavily focused on game management. And, we, and it wouldn't be right here to not mention our, our boy Aldo Leopold, who we talked about last time as kind of the godfather of conservation. We've been reading a little bit from a Sand County Almanac, his favorite book. He, he comes into play during this era and begins to really push for conservation and responsible land use. So our final era, or actually, we got, we got to get some famous guys in here. We've got Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who lived from 1858 to 1919. Not super important on the dates there, but it's important to know he lands right there during the middle of the era of protection. He uh, is widely regarded as maybe the most important U.S. president in terms of wildlife and, and uh, wild places. He was a hunter and a naturalist who brought his love of the outdoors to the White House. In 1903, he established that first National Wildlife Refuge, um, which is now a system that's found all over the country and allows for tons of wildlife habitat and tons of opportunity for recreation on the landscape for Americans. And he's protected huge parcels of land in the, in the national forests. And out west, there are gigantic parcels of public land, kind of rare here in the east, but out west, public land everywhere. And it's maybe arguably one of our most valuable assets here in the U.S., these wild places that are open 
to anyone, which is really, really cool and uh, kind of rare as we look around the world. So Teddy Roosevelt, super important guy. Uh, if we go back to our notes, we're gonna call him, we'll go up here to our famous people, Teddy Roosevelt. I'm just gonna call him the wildlife president. He was important for national wildlife refuges, um, national forests. He helped put in place a lot of our famous national parks today, like Yosemite. Um, and he had uh, he had a lot of background um, hunting and fishing on the landscape, and and really considered. Um, wildlife and wild places a super important valuable part of our american culture and kind of did a lot of work to ensure that we have it that we have what we have today so there we go with our era of game management finally we got to look at our era of environmental management and it's the same exact name as the last one the era of game management but we change one word now we're calling it the era of environmental management beginning in 1966 with the passing of the endangered species act we start to protect creatures more than just game. That's the key change in word, from game to environment. Instead of protecting just game animals and studying just game animals, we begin to realize that having healthy ecosystems and healthy landscapes is critical to the whole thing. So we start to protect the environment, we start to protect habitat, and we realize that having that habitat and a healthy environment is going to yield uh, more wildlife in general. We start to care about creatures that are not game. We put in the Endangered Species Act, and most of the creatures on protected by that Endangered Species Act are not game animals and never were. And now they have federal law protecting them. Uh, that's uh, been a huge success story for lots and lots of creatures, including the bald eagle, which many of you did on your North American wildlife success story. So really cool stuff. During this uh, era of environmental management, our main Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife changed its name. They were actually originally the main Department of Inland Fisheries and Game, which takes us back to this era, right? All they cared about and managed was game. Nowadays, they are the main Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. That term wildlife, remember, is all-encompassing. It includes all those creatures. So... Um, really important one word name one word change in the name changes kind of the entire scope of their mission so let's get our notes down on the era of environmental management um, we'll go back here to our notes the era of environmental management um, we're gonna focus on entire ecosystems we want healthy habitat and landscapes and things like that so the era of an Environmental management is all about focusing on entire ecosystems and we're managing all wildlife now. And I might even underline that wildlife. All wildlife is being managed now. So pretty cool stuff. And maybe we want to get down the, the Endangered Species Act. Again, another first in the world. Um, the Endangered Species Act of 1966, which has now been replicated all over the place, but uh, pretty important stuff. So uh, one last thing we want to get to here as we go through here is this last important person to know. We got to know John Muir is our preservationist to know. We got to know Aldo Leopold. He's the conservationist we need to know. Teddy Roosevelt is our wildlife president and Rachel Carson, it wouldn't be right to teach Maine Fish and Wildlife and not talk about Rachel Carson, a super important figure in uh, the world of wildlife uh, management. She actually uh, published a very important and famous book called Silent Spring, which revealed the really harsh impacts of DDT and on bald eagles and ospreys and, and uh, warned people of a future with possibly silent spring, meaning no birds singing, which was really scary and snapped people around to protecting the environment. Uh, she unfortunately passed away before her book was even published, uh, but she really changed the way we look at pollution and is a super important figure in the environmental movement, Rachel Carson. And you may remember, you may notice uh, that name there. Uh, in fact, our National Wildlife Refuge here in Southern Maine that runs from Wells all the way up to Cape Elizabeth, chunks of land right along the coast, mainly really important migratory bird habitat is named for this person. It's Rachel Carson, National Wildlife Refuge. Some of you may have even been out on land in the Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge. So just a, 
uh, a cool person to know. It's neat to have that, uh, that home connection right here in Saco. We've got a big chunk of Rachel Carson land uh, in that National Wildlife Refuge system. So let's, let's make sure we get Rachel Carson in here. So we're going to call her a famous environmentalist and birder. She wrote Silent Spring which is a really important book I recommend anybody read. And uh, uh, we'll say she solved the mystery of disappearing birds and really all wildlife by connecting DDT, which is a really harsh pesticide that was being used everywhere because it kills bugs real well but unfortunately works its way into the the ecosystem and does some serious damage on a lot of different wildlife so there you have it folks don't want to keep it too long today well, hopefully we got our notes done here we got our famous people all done and we've got our five errors which we'll talk about more in class uh, as we get going but there you have it uh, make sure you get a screenshot of the notes that we took today uh, on your end and submit that in google classroom and i look forward to seeing you guys next time